everybody, welcome to late in the day vlog because we were working all day on fate bonds and character sheets and uh, did not get here. So uh, today I'm going to talk about Inuit myth, which is a super cool subject and I'm excited that somebody asked about it, even though they asked a while ago and I've been late to answer. Um, and I know it's one of those things that like there's a poll right now, so this maybe will interest people in Inuit stuff. Um, don't worry, there's also questions about Navajo stuff and so we'll talk about that another time. But first of all, um, Inuit's mythology is very different from most other mythologies, both in North America and worldwide, in that the gods are not nice people, and they're not viewed as nice people, and nobody likes them and nobody wants them around. Um, because the Inuit lived in a place, and still live, in a place that was so environmentally harsh and difficult to survive in, most of their mythology is actually about, because the gods control those really dangerous and difficult to survive natural features, the gods are probably cruel, and the gods are probably insensitive, and they don't care what happens to you, and they don't care if you live or die. They're a pantheon that does not care about what happens to their people, pretty much. Um, so a lot of what you would do in Inuit religion involves um, begging them to help you, or not even begging them to help you, but begging them not to hurt you. Like saying, I'm going out in the ocean, please don't kill me by sinking my boat. Uh, I need to go out and hunt, please don't let the animals kill me, or please let me succeed in the hunt so that I can eat this winter. Um, it's all about like saying, I know that you're this big power in the universe that does not care much about me, but I'm begging you. Because I'm doing all these rituals that I hope please you, please let me succeed, please let me not die, don't ruin things for me. Um, one of the most famous quotes about Inuit religion is something about, they asked him what they, uh, a, a person who was not Inuit came in as a researcher and asked them what the most important feature that they worshipped was, and they said, we don't worship, we fear. Because it's just, it's an inhospitable, horrible place, and so it's people by inhospitable, horrible gods. And so a lot of the Inuit myths are about people that are terrible to each other, to their communities, and miserable to be around. Which I think is very cool for science setting, because often the gods are, you know, super heroic, or they're at least something that you can kind of look up to and emulate. And what the Inuit were doing was saying, the powers of the universe are obviously cruel and heartless because our lives are cruel and heartless. So these are gods that don't care. These are gods that pursue their own interests and their own things and they don't give a damn about us at all. So I think that's an interesting concept for a pantheon that for once doesn't care at all about the world, is really just only involved in fighting titans and doing what they want to do. A couple examples from Inuit myth that kind of play up how horrible these people can be. Um, one of them is the, there are definitely different versions of myths. Um, because the Inuit were spread out over a very large geographical area, like all over northern Canada and Alaska, different communities would have slightly different versions of myths because they're all orally preserved and retold, and so different storytellers might add something here or subtract something here. They're all basically the same story, but they occasionally have different features involved. So one of them is the story of uh, how the sun and the moon gods became sun and moon gods, and it's a it's a tragic tale. So basically, there's a there's a brother and a sister, and their names vary based on uh, based on where you are. Igaluk and Melina are one of their names, but there's various different ones depending on what area you're in. And anyway, they grow up together as siblings and uh, are very fond of one another. But when they become old enough, they become segregated by gender, which is what you would do in uh, Inuit communities at the time. And so she goes to live with the women and he goes to live with the men. And uh, uh, as they are growing older, he goes to peep at the women's hut because that's what you do when you're a teenager in Inuit myth. And uh, he sees that they're, you know, he's peeping in at all the girls and he sees that his sister is there and she's the most beautiful of all the women now. And so he decides he's up for some incest, uh, which is not okay, by the way, in Inuit society as it isn't okay in most ancient societies. And so he waits until it's dark, and he sneaks in and he rapes her. And she doesn't know who it was, and it keeps happening several nights in a row. And so finally she figures out she's gonna, she covers her hands, in some versions in soot, and some versions in, like, bare fat. Something that is dark and smeary. And the next time that he comes in, she smears it on him. So that the next day, when the lights are on and she can see everybody, she sees the person who has the stuff smeared on him, and it's her brother. And it's the worst. And she realizes what's happened. And it's at this point things get truly horrible, like they weren't horrible enough yet. She comes to him the next day with a basket that she gives to him. And she says, if you have such an appetite for me, if you can't control yourself, then these are for you. And then she turns around and runs away. And he opens up the basket and she's cut off her breasts and given them to him. 
And uh, unfortunately, because he's a horrible person, that actually makes him really excited. And he decides to go after her again. So at that point, she realizes there's nothing she can do about him. He's crazy. So she grabs a torch and she runs out into like the dark and the, the ice. And he grabs a torch and runs after her too, but he trips and the torch is partially extinguished, so its light is fainter. And they run forever with him chasing her and her trying to get away. And she becomes the sun and he becomes the moon. And they go through the sky chasing one another forever. So that's pretty gruesome, you know, as, a, as an origin myth for the sun and the moon deities. And uh, they're probably not the most fun deities you could hang out with in Scion. But interesting, right? We don't have a sun-moon myth quite like that yet in the other pantheons that are out there. The other myth that is the most common that you'll hear for Inuit myth is the myth of Sedna. Uh, Sedna is the, she's originally probably a goddess of hunting and animals and of the water. She's specifically the goddess of marine animals, so seals, whales, sharks, things that you would, probably not sharks actually, seals and whales and fish, things that you would see in the Arctic waters. And uh, she's called upon to kind of say, can you, can you please let us catch these things for food? We need them to live. Um, but also she becomes, over the evolution of Inuit mythology, she becomes the death goddess as well and rules over the underworld, which is a horrible place, by the way. It's called Adlavun, and it is not comfortable. It's the bottom of the ocean and just the freezing and the dark and you're miserable forever. And there's a guy there that tortures you. That's what their underworld is like. So, you know, their, their happiness with life doesn't, is extending to the underworld as well. They're really not, not a hopeful people. But anyway, the myth of Sedna is that uh, she's a very beautiful woman, a very beautiful goddess, and she uh, is courted by a lot of different people. And as before, there are different versions of this myth. So in some versions, uh, she rejects everyone because she doesn't think any of them are good enough for her, and her father gets really angry with her. Or in some versions, she does something unnatural, like she marries a dog or she marries a bird. Um, and obviously that's not okay, so people freak out about that. And in some versions, she just, uh, it has nothing to do with her marrying them, but just it's been a really bad hunting season and her father can't afford to feed her anymore. And whatever the case is, she ends up in a boat with her father, who, by the way, becomes the psychopomp of the underworld at the end of the story. She ends up in a boat with him, and uh, a horrible storm is whipped up. And sometimes it's whipped up by whatever unnatural thing she married that she shouldn't have, which is angry about her leaving. Sometimes it's the gods saying, you're terrible, get out. Sometimes it's just bad luck, because they live in a place where sometimes storms hit, and then you die because your kayak falls over, and there's nothing you can do about it. And so uh, she almost falls overboard, and she grabs hold of the kayak to try to stay in. And her father is afraid that she's going to pull the kayak over, and he's going to drown too. So he takes his knife out and he cuts off the first joints of her fingers. And they fall into the ocean and they become whales. And, uh, but she still clings on and so he cuts off the second joint of her fingers and they become seals. And so on until her fingers are completely gone and she falls overboard into the ocean. And then depending on the version of the myth, sometimes he lets her back into the boat when the storm ends. But she is like permanently miserable and vengeful against him and everyone else, which is kind of understandable because that sucks. In some versions, she just sinks to the bottom of the ocean, and that's where she lives now. No matter what, by the end of it, she goes to the horrible underworld of Adlavun. She now administers the place and is the goddess of it. That's John doing administrative work in the background, by the way, if you hear all that rustling. I think you hear that. And uh, she becomes the overseer of the underworld and the mistress of all underwater creatures and monsters. And so she's one of the most major gods in Inuit mythology, and uh, she's not pleasant or happy. Nobody isn't pleasant or happy. And her father is down there too, and he's uh, he brings the souls of the dead down there to that horrible place, and then sometimes, depending on the place, some people say he tortures them, some people say he just brings them down there and leaves them in the horribleness. In a few, you can like bargain with him to try to convince him not to take you, but you're probably not going to succeed. Um, so yeah, it's... Uh, it's a pretty brutal set of myths, really, but one that I think would be really interesting to explore in Scion, especially since it's in a geographic area. We don't get a lot of mythology from, like, normally. Like, obviously they have some, but you don't hear about it as much. So I'd be very excited about that. Um, they have other gods. There's Nanuk uh, Tongarkusk is a perennially popular. He's the, the polar bear god, and his thing is just that he controls hunting and he controls polar bears. And so since bears were one of the big... Uh, staples of life, like you needed bears to be able to eat in some parts of of Inuit territory, you would uh, do elaborate rituals to try to convince Nanuk that you were a worthy hunter, and so you deserve to be able to get a bear. 
And not only would that be to help you find a bear, but because Nanak is in control of the bears, he's always the guy that decides, are you going to win or is the bear going to win? And if he doesn't like you, then the bear's going to eat you, and that's going to be the end. So um, he's, a, he's a popular one. There's also a caribou goddess who has similar functions. Um, there are several gods of, like, storm. There's a god in charge of the darkness of, because they're up at the, the pole, like they have several days of darkness a year. There's a god in charge of that. Um, there's the whole, the northern lights aren't actually gods, but they're kind of conceived of as the spirits of ancestors that are uh, on their way to or from the underworld. And so you don't want to like look at them or get too close to them because they might take you with them. There's a lot of neat stuff going on up there. And then there's a general concept of uh, Sila, which is both the major god and the concept of... Uh, kind of soul and spirit, um, which is, they're not really animists as in everything as a soul, but everything is kind of permeated by soul, which comes back to the same source. And so you have an, an interesting underlying concept there that would be fun to do something with. So anyway, I am a big fan of the Inuit um, because despite them being terrible people, they're also super interesting and their mythology is a lot of fun to read about. And uh, they're actually one of those pantheons that is still worshiped to the modern day. Um, a lot of Inuit people now are Christian, but Several of them, especially the ones that are in really remote areas, still worship their traditional uh, their traditional way. Or many that are not even in that remote areas will still do traditional practices and just kind of work them into Christianity and kind of syncretization process. So that's all super neat and exciting. And so I'd love to work on them. Not that I wouldn't love to work on everything, right? I want to do everything. But um, that is our quick and dirty blog. I'm sorry about the lateness of it today. Um, but we will see you next time and hopefully be a little bit less left-ish. And then there's John. He says bye, everyone. <laughs>